So back to the First World War and uh, the art uh, produced in response to, uh, to the war. Uh, so the first uh, artistic superstar of the period would be Christopher Nevinson. And uh, he was a soldier for a short period. Uh, uh, he uh, saw the, uh, the trench war in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, then uh, uh, he uh, he returned and started to um, to uh, exhibit his works, uh, showing the life in the trenches uh, again in the modern style, perhaps not as uh, uh, bold as the work of uh, let's say the early work of David Bomber, but uh, still. Um, dehumanized or rather uh, merging the human with the machine especially the uh, the works showing the troops in the trenches like the uh, the painting called French troops resting or especially his greatest success of this period called La Mitrailleuse showing the uh, soldiers um, uh, firing a machine gun. So uh, what we have is uh, um, a, a close-up scene of uh, of the soldiers operating a machine gun, and like like they are becoming parts of the machine themselves. Uh, sometimes uh, it could be quite bitter. Uh, of course, all these artists, even though um, they volunteered, because in the First World War. All of the British troops were voluntary forces. There were no, there was no conscription. There was no obligation. So um, men were um, basically encouraged, uh, and it was presented as a patriotic du duty to join the army, and uh, many of them did. But uh, of course, uh, uh, once they uh, they got to the front line, they uh, could see there was nothing glorious. There was nothing heroic. In this kind of war, uh, it was mud and diseases and uh, uh, mm, killing gases and machines and tanks and all those uh, horrible things uh, of mechanized war. So uh, very often they would show drastic scenes and give them ironic titles like Paths of Glory. Uh, this is another of Nevinson's uh, works um, dealing with the war. Uh, and uh, it shows the um, soldiers or the, the, the bodies of soldiers uh, uh, somewhere lying in the mud uh, in the no man's land, so between the, the front lines. And there's absolutely nothing glorious about it. There was, however, one aspect of the First World War that was treated as glorious. And this was aviation. And the First World War was the first conflict in which uh, aeroplanes were used and the pilots were really given the star treatment. And uh, many artists, such as Nevinson, um, actually uh, requested to be taken up in the air by, uh, by the, uh, the pilots and they sketched... Uh, from a completely new perspective. So uh, here we have one of such uh, such uh, uh, images made by Nevinson. Uh, it's called banking at 4,000 feet. Nothing to do with money banking. It's about kind of tilting the, um, the plane. And uh, if you look close, you can even see the hand of uh, Nevinson clutching the uh, the side of the plane as uh, the pilot is uh, is sitting uh, in front of him and, and um, piloting the plane. So uh, this is something that would really attract massive uh, uh, attention and uh, um, the pilots and generally aviation uh, became one of the um, glorious subjects. Uh, of the First World War and the interwar period and also uh, during the Second World War, but we'll return to this uh, next uh, week. Uh, and one more artist, uh, the artist uh, whose uh, career would include two world wars uh, and uh, a period uh, between, uh, Paul Nash, one of the great 
British artist of the early 20th century. Uh, he um, was um, one of the artists who were very inspired by the British landscape. He loved the trees. He had some um, sad family history. His mother suffered from uh, mental illness, so his family moved out of town. They lived in some uh, home and he mostly spent his uh, days wandering uh, around and uh, sketching trees. He loved the trees, he loved nature. Uh, for him, uh, the, uh, the most important aspect of, England, of Englishness was really English nature. So, um, if we look at his early works from the period before the war, it's mostly the landscapes and the trees. And uh, he had this, this kind of childish uh, dream that each tree had a personality. He would make some sort of fantasy stories about them. And uh, you can see that uh, reflected in his paintings. But uh, when the war started, he uh, volunteered, of course. Uh, so he uh, he went to uh, to the front lines. Uh, he didn't so uh, he didn't see action. This was uh, quite an interesting story because uh, he was saved by an accident. Uh, of course, he uh, would sketch and paint all the time. And once uh, when he was sketching, uh, he accidentally fell into the trench and broke his ribs. So uh, he was taken to a military hospital and uh, then to convalesce in England. And uh, just a few days after he was, uh, he was injured, uh, in an accident completely unrelated to war, uh, his uh, uh, comrades, his colleagues uh, were almost entirely decimated in one of the uh, one of the battles of the uh, of the first world war so he was uh, a very um, lucky or, or perhaps unlucky uh, survivor uh, so he was of course shocked he was devastated he probably suffered from what you might call a uh, post traumatic stress disorder uh, he um, demanded to be returned to the front line, but this time in the official capacity of the painter. So he was not a soldier just sketching and painting. He was the official uh, licensed painter commissioned by the British Army to, uh, to document the war. And uh, being mostly interested in the landscapes, uh, he, uh, especially uh, his art from the First World War, because uh, as I said already, he had a long career and will return to his work uh, next week. Uh, he mostly concentrated on the scarred landscapes of the, um, of the uh, fields of war. Uh, so uh, what we have is not really the trenches, it's sometimes the trenches, sometimes even the soldiers, but it's mostly the devastated landscape with the uh, um, trunks of trees, with the um, uprooted ground, with uh, the mud that looks um, horrible, it looks like, like um, blood, like something primeval, something really um, terrifying, something hellish even. Uh, and uh, just like Nevinson before him, he would sometimes give um, quite sarcastic titles and uh, one of his best works from this period, uh, he named We Are Making a New World. Uh, and it shows this very destroyed natural um, environment uh, with the mud, with the, uh, the um, destroyed trees, with some hills uh, in the distance looking blood red. Uh, we don't see the soldiers, we don't even see the bodies. It's uh, like the, the new world after the apocalypse. It's like completely um, the humans wipe themselves off the face of the earth. Uh, we will return to these artists, many of these artists, uh, next uh, week, because now uh, we are only in the second decade of the uh, 20th century and they had long careers and uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they continued to paint and many of them, especially Paul Nash, uh, uh, were engaged in, uh, in the artistic response uh, to the Second World War. Uh, just to finish off uh, some other artists, uh, of course uh, a very important uh, part of the war effort, artistic war effort, was uh, the propaganda posters. 
and uh, especially in the First World War, women did not go to the front line. They did not um, uh, go into active uh, fighting, but because so many men did, women were uh, encouraged uh, by um, the government and, and the artists, of course, uh, to join the workforce, to go work in factories, to produce all the things that would have been produced by men who are now fighting in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the war. So we have uh, some posters uh, actually glorifying the women who would go um, into factories and produce munitions and such things. Uh, there were also some women artists who would document the life of these women. So um, artists like Flora Lyon who would uh, uh, make, would paint the scenes showing the life in the factories, uh, the, the working women, very often women who would not be working otherwise, uh, who were from the middle class, from the upper middle class, who would be just wives and mothers and uh, hostesses uh, rather than factory workers, but because of the war, uh, they, uh, they joined the war effort. Uh, also, uh, as uh, I already mentioned in the case of uh, Paul Nash, uh, the wounded soldiers were brought back to England to heal, to convalesce, and uh, sometimes uh, they uh, really had uh, horrible uh, war wounds uh, that would scar them uh, in very drastic ways and uh, actually uh, one of the interesting cycles of uh, let's say war paintings is the series a big series um, of uh, portraits of the uh, wounded in the war made by Henry Tonks, who was actually a professor of painting in the Slade Academy I mentioned, so this art school that uh, many of the, uh, of the young uh, generation of artists attended. So uh, he was uh, a medical doctor, he was also a painter, uh, and uh, he was asked to make the kind of before and after facial surgery uh, documentation, but he uh, took a kind of artistic slant to it and uh, uh, here you have um, some examples and I would say the least drastic examples. I didn't want to shock you, if you want to, uh, you can just Google Henry Tonks and uh, the portraits of the wounded in the war and uh, you'll see some horrible wounds. Uh, these are uh, more likely to be the after uh, pictures. So after the um, surgery, uh, after the uh, the treatment, when the um, the soldiers uh, were given some sort of uh, of help already, and uh, the last uh, image for this week is the memorial um, chapel painted by another great British artist, someone who will be very important in the interwar period and later. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Stanley Spencer. So uh, here we have just the first of his works. We are going to see some more, uh, but he mostly started his career in the interwar period. Uh, however, he uh, was also uh, a soldier in the First World War. He was stationed... Uh, um, I don't remember where, but uh, he, uh, he was inspired by his personal uh, experiences in the war, uh, in the war uh, when painting this memorial and it shows the scene of resurrection. I hope you can see it, or you can perhaps Google. Uh, it's called Sandham Memorial Chapel uh, by Stanley Spencer and uh, it shows the, the traditional religious scene of resurrection, but it's the uh, fallen soldiers um, being resurrected and carrying the little white crosses from the war cemeteries. Uh, so uh, th this, is, this is really a kind of um, tribute um, uh, to, the, uh, to the soldiers who lost their lives in the uh, First World War.
So uh, next week we continue. Um, I strongly suggest you watch the documentaries. I'll give you the links. And um, we'll see the interwar period and the Second World War and perhaps also a little bit of what happened later. Thank you very much.